Um, hello and welcome. My name is Ravi Al Khouri. I'm diversity manager at the German Film Institute and Film Museum here in Frankfurt, the DFF. Anna Serna, who's the CEO of the Swedish Film Institute, said during the launch of the New Dawn Fund at the latest Cannes Film Festival that, and I quote, the film industry is still a closed shop fun funded on old networks. More filmmakers need to let to be let if, in, in if the film industry is to be as vibrant, exciting, and important as it can be. I have the pleasure to welcome you today to this panel in which we are addressing new European diversity and inclusion initiatives in film, what their aims are, if they are creating any kind of development and shifts in today's environment, and of course, if these initiatives are resulting in a real change in the creative industry. I would like to introduce you first to the five panelists that I have the chance to have today with me and who took the time to be with us today. First, um, a very warm welcome to Bero Bayer, who's uh, of course the CEO of the Netherlands Film Fund as of March 1st of 2020. Uh, Bero has been the general artistic, uh, general and artistic director of the International Film Festival of Rotterdam. Um, and before that, he served as a three year term as a film consultant at the Netherlands Film Fund. Um, he has really championed so many initiatives when it comes to diversity and inclusion. He also supported, among others, uh, Palestinian cinema to have a more international appeal uh, through films like Rana's Wedding and Paradise Now. And alongside uh, Anna Zerna, whom I just mentioned, uh, Bero has launched the New Dawn Fund at the latest Cannes Film Festival, which we are going to discuss in a bit. Uh, Bero, most welcome with us. Uh, I also have the pleasure to have with us uh, Melanie Hoyes, who's Industry and Inclusion Executive at the British Film Institute, the BFI. Uh, she has completed postgraduate studies and teaching film and TV at undergraduate level. And through the BFI, she has the opportunity to use this knowledge in a contemporary industry context. She has completed a research project to historically map ethnic diversity in on-screen representation in the UK for the Black Star season at the BFI South Bank in 2016. We're also gonna talk a bit about that. And um, of course, the, she has produced a, a real amount of uh, research and studies. She has written pieces for Sight and Sound, and she has also written an academic collection of essays around Black film and British cinema. In her role as industry inclusion executive, Melanie advocates for increased access and equity in the UK film sector, as well as consulting in and partnering with global partners to embed diversity and inclusion into policy and practice. In particular, Melanie champions the BFI's diversity standards and seeks to establish data and research as a baseline for meaningful change. She's also the Europe in the Europe Council uh, lead for the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. Welcome, Melanie. I also have the pleasure to welcome Marion Schmidt, who's the co-director of the Documentary Association of Europe. Uh, Marion is a freelance project manager and consultant for individuals and organizations. Her field of expertise is in project management and organizational development in the international documentary arts and development sector. Marion is the co-director of the Documentary Association of Europe. She's also the co-founder of Docsbox, where she held several positions till April 2020 and was the project director of the International Documentary Convention 2018 and 19. Marion is a consultant in the, to the film department of the Deutsche Welle Akademie and has contributed their expertise to projects of the Goethe Institute. Um, and she also sits on the board of several organizations in the film world, including, including the NAS Network, and ATEF, the Anti-Racism Task Force in European Film, and is part of initiatives that champion anti-racism, equality, fair working conditions, and representation in the film and NGO sectors, and the society at large. She is an alumnus of Eurodoc and holds a master's degree in arts administration and cultural policy from the University of London in the UK. Welcome, Marion. I also have the pleasure to welcome Elham Shakarifar, who's a BAFTA nominated producer, curator, and writer. Her credits include The Reluctant Revolutionary, A Syrian Love Story, and The Northern Soul. Um, these are films by Sean McAllister. Uh, also, she worked on The Runner with Sal Taji Farouki of Love and War by uh, Hikaru Toda and Island by Stephen Eastwood. And also she has worked on Ayuni by Yasmin Fadda, which has been uh, touring festivals lately. 
Elham is a program advisor for the London Film Festival and has curated pro programs for Shubak, for the Barbican, for Bird's Eye View Festival. And she also has taught documentary at Berlin Freie, at UCL London, as well as internationally from Georgia to Lebanon, Egypt and Tunisia. And Elham is a recipient of the BFI Vision Award in 2016. She was awarded the Women in Film and TV BBC Factual Award in 2017 and named producer on the rise in Screen International's 2020 Brit 50 list. Welcome, Elham. And last but not least, we have our neighbor, uh, Patrick Schaaf, who's joining us uh, from uh, Hessen Film und Medien uh, here in Hessen. Patrick works as head of strategic development and communication for Hessen Film und Medien. He has graduated in law and since then worked in documentary film production for ZDF Arte and ZDF Dreisat. Uh, and also as a journalist in film departments. Patrick has also worked as press officer for Allianz Deutschland and as chief of staff to the mayor of Offenbach before returning to the film branch in 2017. And we're very happy to have him also in the film branch. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for uh, being with us. Uh, having five guests, meaning we have so many topics to speak about, and I hope that during this hour we're gonna manage as many of them. Uh, I'm gonna start with you, uh, Bero. Um, on July 12, uh, during the Cannes Film Festival, which took place in the summer this year, um, alongside Anna, you launched this new initiative, which was very fascinating for so many of us, uh, which is called the New Dawn. It's a fund uh, that you put together uh, with Anna, and it's a new gap financing fund, which will be managed by the Netherlands Film Fund, and will offer a maximum of 200,000 euros for individual feature fiction films and 100,000 for feature documentaries, supporting between five and 10 projects per year. Um, and it's aimed for a group of filmmakers that have traditionally found it hard to get financing for their projects. Uh, the fund, which will open in spring 2022, um, is addressed to directors, producers, and or screenwriters from one of the groups that the United Nations Human Rights Act specifies as discriminated group. So I would like to start with you by asking these two questions. First, I want, I'm very interested in the idea behind the creation of such a fund. First, I mean, there are already eight uh, European funders that are involved. And more, interestingly, I, more interestingly, I'm interested in the target group. Um, the idea, of course, that um, there are discriminated groups according to the UN, uh, UN Human Rights Act. Does that mean that there are other target groups that are not included in what the UN Human Rights Act describes as uh, discriminated. So first, I wanted to, uh, to understand from you the main incentive behind the fund. And according to you, of course, who would you like uh, to apply to this fund? Uh, thank you. Well, um, let's start at the beginning. I think it's a um, uh, very relevant discussion for all public funders, just as for the rest of the film industry, to look at ways to truly become an inclusive sector. Uh, and I think that starts with the realization also for many funders to realize that um, uh, all the systems we have in place somehow still um, maintain a system which is based on exclusion rather than inclusion. There is a uh, sometimes unwillingly system that you help support, which is based on who you know, who gets into the film academies, who gets networked to whom, who gets, uh, who gets the budgets to be uh, starting off in production. And this is, this is a huge problem. This is a huge uh, realization that I think has been with funders for some while now as they uh, especially at the netherlands film funds for instance realized the, the value of creating the awareness this that this needs to be addressed very locally very nationally within finding the groups of filmmakers within the netherlands for instance that um, uh, don't feel part of the bubble and quite realistically and factually so they are quite simply not uh, among the many applicants that we receive at the film fund. So the first element is trying to create that awareness. Second element is to create an organization as a film fund that does justice to uh, those more varied applications as such. 
which means uh, the team members and the actual people looking at the projects, making the selection, uh, that needs to be a better reflection of, of um, uh, the different perspectives that we're hoping to attract. Uh, this all makes perfect sense to me, and uh, we're trying to do this in various ways. It also means that nationally, you have to uh, put much more effort into communication, into looking at all your regulations, which sometimes become a catch-22 for new people to enter. Uh, uh, Way back in the past, you could only apply for feature film funding if you've had realized as a producer two films already, which means how are you ever going to start with your feature film? It's not possible. It's things like this that we need started to address uh, already in the last couple of years. And each time we move a little bit forward, we realize it's still not enough. There's still more that needs to be done on all levels, not just finding the talents and giving them seed money for development. It's also connecting them to that other layer of not very diverse, uh, uh, the, the not very diverse group of producers, let alone distributors or sales agents or exhibitors or film programmers or film journalists. The list goes on and on of elements that we realize we need to pay attention to for for this system that has cemented itself into a very singular vision over 125 years is ever to open up. Um, and one of the, as we were doing this, was one of the elements that um, I felt were missing, uh, especially in regards with my colleagues now, the other public funders of Europe, was that there seemed to be lacking an international perspective to these efforts. And this is quite frankly how it started that at a certain point I thought, well, this is weird. How come there's not an international element that takes, uh, that helps underscore that this should be our first priority. Maybe the second one is sustainability, but let's start with this one as a number one priority, especially during COVID times where it was a mess to begin with. So, well, how are we going to make sure this happens? So I called the one person that I thought is at least for gender equality, the most outspoken person, which is Anna Cerner, and we had a chat. And, uh, and I think within five minutes, we came up with the idea to say, well, this actually means that we need to create a collaboration of public funders that say we're going to add an international perspective to all those efforts that hopefully many of us funders are already uh, taking those steps on a national level, which includes, of course, uh, how the BFI is thinking about diversification, how Canada is thinking about becoming more diverse, how our colleague funds in Scandinavia, Germany, uh, Belgium, etc., are also thinking of making those steps. And um, but let's say that the last year we've been trying to figure out a way to structure that in the right way. We're still in the middle of the process. It's because um, it's quite complicated. It's all of a sudden we come up with the idea to say, hey, national funders, here's an idea. You're going to put money in a pot and you're not going to be sure in any way, shape or form that that money goes to your national film projects because it goes to the ones that a separate individual independent selection commission commission deems most uh, artistically relevant and relevant to the ideas of the fund. Um, so that's a lot of technical figuring out how to make that happen. Um, uh, the nicest thing is that many funders immediately realize, of course, this makes total sense. It makes sense to add on an international perspective, if only to put the pressure inwards to realize we have to keep moving nationally to widen the scope of, of accessibility for what we do as with public money, basically. The Netherlands Film Fund spends taxpayer money so they better do justice to the to all taxpayers and not just a bunch of people that look like me. So um, uh, if all goes well, knock on wood, and we're pretty far with uh, 10 public funders, we'll be hopefully able to actually launch the call. And we're hoping around December to be able to outline the full list of criteria and how we're going to go about this to uh, create at least one more possibility for filmmakers that have found it traditionally very hard to get some funding off the ground to give them that additional push to say, hey, we see you internationally, you're taken seriously, here's money, do something nice with it, we don't want anything in return. Um, and uh, the key element here is, of course, that the, that the 
way this should be structured is that there is indeed an independent selection committee which looks at the quality of the projects. Now, one of the main obstacles, it is probably referring to your second part of the question, is who gets in and how do you measure that? Uh, in other words, how, who do you exclude from accessing that fund, uh, uh, wanting to be a more inclusive fund? The element which we chose for now is to make sure that there is a right balance between the national uh, initiatives that are taking place and this international one. So it's not development money, it's not seed money, it's not the first stop. You need to have at least one of the participating funders first go ahead to be able to apply. It's the additional element that you think, well, actually, like many films from the Netherlands in general, um, you need international co-productions or you need international recognizability, etc. That's what this is for. So we're hoping to get projects that have already uh, some finance in place from their local local fund, from their national fund, whether it's through a specific call or just a regular call, we really don't care. Um, and we're looking not at the themes. We're not looking at the content. This is very uh, important. We're not looking to find people say, well, I've got a great film about discrimination or about underrepresentation or about diversity or about what it means to be a Moroccan living, uh, living in the Netherlands. That's not what we're looking for at all. The mere threshold for accessing the fund is that you can make a, 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 a good case for why the top team of the production, director, producer, writer, consider themselves by self-declaration to say, yes, we are part of an underrepresented group, and this is why we fulfill the initiative, the goal of the initiative, regardless of what the themes or the script is about. And there's a logic here to say, well, um, uh, we, we'd rather have films that deal with, that are, um, how can I put this easily, a regular rom-com, but made by people of that consider themselves to be of an underrepresented group, and we're using the UN Declaration as a guide there, uh, is preferred to uh, a group of established, let's say, white filmmakers that would say, we're going to make a film about what it feels like to be that same Moroccan in the Netherlands. Um, the toughest nut to crack here uh, is um, what do you ask, how do you measure, and what do you do with that data. Can we actually ask people to check boxes or to tick in and say, well, look at how underrepresented I am because of X, Y, Z. We're not going to do that. It's legal, quite frankly, for most of us funders, so we're not going to do that. We're just going to ask you to give a motivation of why you think you, your team and the way that you're about handling that project fulfills the goals of this fund, which is A, the realization that there is underrepresentation on all levels in the film industry and b that it boils down to empowerment of the leading creative group that is active there uh, and how you describe that will be the second case so um, i'd rather be overwhelmed with applications than uh, than being than than being uh, in, an, in another way an ex a fund based on exclusivity after all uh, so the, the main threshold, I guess, will turn out to be that you need to have to have 50% of your finance in place and need to have support of a selective production funder um, from any of the participating funders. And hopefully, this initiative, uh, as we're starting with at least a three-year pilot, some funds can only commit for two years now, but we'll see how that goes, but that it creates a little bit of a movement where more funders realize we want to be part of this element we want to give some of that money away uh, and that in its spin-off or at, let's say in its curtail it it brings along network possibilities presentation possibilities for those filmmakers so that, that after a while they're actually not that often represented in anymore but are what we hope to be uh, uh, a logical thing of having you know of having a logic of inclusivity that just bears down to who has a great story to tell who has a great vision of bringing that to cinema, regardless of where you're coming from. I think starting something is always a challenge. So here you have so many challenges that you're dealing with. And I want to move to Marion because 
Um, Marion, with you as well, you came up with a set of ideas that something needed to be done while thinking about um, the anti-racism task force for European film. It has been created to tackle basically uh, institutional, institutional racism in the European film industry. And um, at the moment, there are over 30 film institutions that associations, funds, and industry members based in Europe. And I, if I read well on the website, this summer has been really full for you because you've been uh, trying to put up together a long-term strategy. Uh, Marion, you're also part of this steering committee for ATEF. And I really wanted to understand from you, based also a bit on what Bero has been saying, um, how important is an initiative like ATEF today and what do you essentially want to achieve with it? Do you think something tangible can come out out of tackling uh, institutionalized racism today in Europe? There we go again, the unmute. Thank you very much, Rabi, and also thank you very much for having me. I have many questions for Beru, but I will hold them for later. Um, yes, I'm, um, I'm here with different hats today. I'm on the one hand board member of the Anti-Racism Task Force of European Film that Rabia just mentioned, uh, short for it is ARTIF. It's easier to say than the whole name. And I'm also co-founder and co-director of the Documentary Association of Europe. And I think I will talk about DAY, as we call it, later a little bit, but now I'm focused on ARTIF. In fact, um, ATEF was created or initiated by Matthias Walter Knoll, the director of EFA. Um, back then, she, he was still the director of the European film market, as most of you will know, um, right after the murder of George Floyd, where he felt it was absolutely necessary to bring in decision makers um, of the European film industry together to finally start acting upon um, what is a, as you said, Vero, quite rightly, a closed job that is obviously also subject to systemic um, injustices and institutional racism, as most of the institutions in our countries are. And um, around 40 decision makers from across the industry followed um, his call. And we met, I think it was for the first time in June of last year, for um, two informal exchanges on the topic. And we soon realized that obviously um, all of us within our organizations have been using and working on inclusion and diversity and, um, and trying to convert racism in different forms, shapes and forms and on completely different levels of awareness as well. And there's, there was also like a big difference. I mean, of course, looking at Europe and uh, the reality in, in 26 nation states or more, if you don't only focus on the European Union, there are, of course, completely different realities in each of the countries. Um, thus, we felt it was um, important to start with inner work and to start with the individual and to start with the individual human being that eventually is also basically sitting within the institutions making the decisions. So we got our act together and started fundraising to be able to offer these 40 organizations or 40 representatives training by Emilia Roy, who is the founder of the Center for Intersexual Justice and um, has just recently um, released an amazing book. I think it only came out in German that is called Why We Matter. So I can only um, recommend it to anyone and everyone who reads German. Um, and um, actually three funds that are here in the room, namely the BFI, Hessen Film, and the Netherlands Film Fund were among the first funds that came in and pledged money. So we were able to run these trainings. And in these trainings, we had, I mean, all of us, I guess, again, on various different levels, faced our own fragilities. Some of us probably had for the first time to deal with what is called white fragility, sit with discomfort. We were graciously and very generously also um, supported, I may say, by BIPOC um, and Black um, colleagues of ours who were there and um, again took on the role, role in, many, in, on, in many situations to uh, kind of hold space for us and our questions and our concerns and our fragility. And I feel like this training has been incredible, incredibly I mean, successful is, a, is maybe not the right word because how do you measure such a success? But I felt, and also from the feedback that we have received, it has 
it has just kind of set in motion many thought processes. And of course, I would be most interested to hear more from Melanie and Patrick and Beryl, who all three of them attended um, most, if not all, of the training. So I guess it would be also very interesting to, to hear from them what it did meant for their work. Now, we took some time after this first year and we got together um, and worked a bit on the strategy just recently. Um, we have agreed on a, on a system where the steering committee that we have created will be the central decision-making power. We have no interest in having the um, having you know, having a top-down, fully-fledged organization, but we are also very much aware that ARTIF needs to continue and needs to continue doing the work um, without, though, replicating what is already happening. So um, on the one hand, what we believe in is that training is something that we want to continue offering, uh, and this will become relevant in the next round of funding. We will probably offer this training in a different format, um, and um, we are also thinking about creating some kind of an annual summit or get together for organizations and different initiatives. But that's yet to be announced. So I also don't want to, um, you know, reveal uh, too much as of yet. Um, I think the aim of ARTIF is to really, or I would say the priority art, the priority target group are the mostly white decision makers within the industry. And of course, I would call on every single one of them, including myself, that we have to do the work ourselves. However, I feel like ARTIF is a, can be a tool to push, to push and at the same time to create the spaces in which this work can take place in ways that it doesn't have to be on the shoulders of um, the BIPOC community that is working within our industry and beyond. And of course, um, ATIF is also a space that is amplifying and supporting existing initiatives without wanting, as I said, like to replicate them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I would say um, for now, where, where we're at. We have, um, we are also open, we are going to open for more members, but we are still in the process of creating the guidelines around this and how people can become a member and what it means and, and so on and so forth. So it's really quite exciting. So many things have already been said in just uh, two keynotes. Um, and I think also it would be interesting now from Melanie to hear about reflecting on that. Um, Melanie, you've been, as I said before, very active, uh, as you've been really an active speaker uh, on many issues related to diversity and inclusion because of your part, part uh, because of your work at the BFI, but not just that. Um, I mean, also through your work at the BFI, the, the mapping that you did, the, 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 the on-screen representation then in uh, what you did for the for the Black Star season. And also you work at the BFI, which has conceived the diversity standards, oddly enough, exactly in the same year, in 2016, uh, which aims to increase representation in front and behind uh, the camera. Uh, I have two questions for you, um, uh, Melanie, in regards to first, the role of an institution like the BFI to actively work for inclusion uh, and diversity uh, and taking things seriously now for so many years. And also because of uh, the, 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 the answers of Bero and of uh, Marion, I was also interested, you were involved in, both in ATEF and uh, in the New Dawn um, initiative. I wanted also to understand how important is it for you to support European initiatives like these uh, as part of your work at the BFI, but also as, um, as an individual. Um, yeah, so I think in terms of the role of an institution such as a BFI, uh, we're a public funder. We are funded uh, by the public, by government um, and by the National Lottery. So it feels um, imperative, really, and it's our, our wish to represent the public that funds us. That just makes sense in all of our activity. Um, and we have vast and wide activity around our archives. We have a library, we're a cinema, uh, we fund films through our film fund uh, and various other, about 44 different businesses <laughs> in one thing. So it feels across the pipeline of industry and education. Um, we would not be doing our job if we're, if we're not representing the public who we are serving. 
Um, so that's imperative. Um, I think in terms of the things that we're doing, um, you know, we really believe in long-term interventions. So something like the diversity standards um, and our bullying and harassment and racism policy and principle and guidelines, you know, policy is the start. Um, it gives you guidance. It's, a, it's around uh, giving people guidance around how to change their behaviors and engage with diversity and inclusion in an authentic way, um, but they're only as good as the engagement with them. So uh, we also try and think about what we're doing around those policies to help people meet them, um, to give support in our other activity, like our film academy, um, to get the industry kind of to a place where they feel comfortable with this. That's thinking about language, thinking about data collection, anything that helps to create a baseline to be able to engage in a way that will begin to move the dial because we have been stuck in cycles of initiatives or you know ways in which we think a problem is happening in one place and we try and tackle that and that's not working so we throw that in the bin and we try something else what we're interested in is what we do in with a 360 approach as Beryl was saying like this goes across from production to audiences you know and reception so how do we embed inclusive thinking throughout that process and throughout the people um, that are involved in those processes and that decision making so the diversity standards is one of those um, things that we do and what I've tried to embed while I've been at the BFI is thinking about reporting it was set up very much as an internal policy for our funds for all of our funds um, and has been adopted globally and in different sectors um, by the BAFTA awards and perhaps have their own version. Um, so they're sort of getting to the end of their first life in, um, in, in the way that they're written. They're very sort of British, based around British context, data collection, law, um, and also film, whereas they're being used in sort of television and games and theatre. So it's really thinking about how we report on that um, what successes we can see that they are having and if they're not having them in the right places, what we do next to make sure that the focus is in the right places and where we want to see that change. So that's what we're in the process of doing at the moment um, with a review and consulting with industry and thinking about how we maybe um, create a kind of revised version to take into account all of these things in the global context that they're now being used in as well. So. Um, that's where we are with those. Um, I think in terms of ARTEF and New Dawn and generally uh, my role is, is kind of external facing and um, you know about global partnerships. I just think we can't do this work in a silo. I think lots of people have been trying to do that for a really long time and it doesn't work. Um, we're all, as uh, Marion was saying, in different spaces and different levels of conversation around the issue, but the issues are the same. Um, so I think the idea of trying to do something on your own that many other people have tried in many different ways over many years uh, feels kind of insane at this point. And so actually the reason why I feel like it's important to engage um, in these is, is the collaboration. And I think that's the only way that we're going to see the change that we want to see is by learning about best practice, um, sharing stories, sharing failures um, of which we have had them as well, um, you know, the lessons that we've learned and how we've gone about things, the lessons we're still learning. I think the the idea of trying to do this and fix everything on your own is, is just not gonna happen and hasn't happened. So the only way to really push it forward um, long-term is to work together and think about ways in which we can do that, you know, as people, as humans, um, and, you know, hopefully see some change uh, in the long-term. Uh, thank you so much, Melanie. So much of what you said also basically reflects, I think, the work that uh, uh, Patrick uh, is doing. Uh, Patrick, I'm coming to you because, of course, the DFF is located in Frankfurt, it's, which is located in Hessen, and it's very natural to speak to you about as an institution, but also as a funding body that is seeking to support more diverse stories in film. Uh, here in the region. I mean, um, Frankfurt alone has 50, has over 51% of its population uh, with, a, with an immigrant background. So I wanted to ask you also in regards to what Melanie has been saying that we don't do things alone. You've been trying to really create trainings and offer workshops and um, uh, panels to support uh, the industry here. Um, can you tell us a tiny bit about 
your what initiatives you are taking as Hassan Film Umedian, and how do you feel this? How do you feel about the exchange between between you and the local industry here? Are people really active in taking part? Do you feel like there is resistance um, when it comes to more diverse stories? When it comes to bringing more diverse stories forward? Yeah, first, uh, firstly, firstly, thank you very much for having me here. Um, yes. Well, it's it's quite a challenging situation for us as there have not been many blueprints uh, in the German funding uh, landscape regarding diversity. Hamburg has launched uh, their initiative uh, last year, I think. And um, in all other matters, we were looking to, to other countries. We were looking to the UK. We were looking at the BFI and the BFI standards. And um, I think there are many aspects that you um, have to take a look at. There's uh, firstly, it's, it's not it's not something you will solve top down just by regulations. You have to get people on board. So there's also uh, the necessity to to educate people to to raise awareness. Uh, that is very necessary. And I think it's also necessary to have common standards and um, in, in, in the German funding landscape, but maybe even abroad uh, with uh, other regional funds or other countries. So um, the whole process gets more transparent. And um, then you also need um, this like, like a qualitative uh, evaluation and a quantitative uh, evaluation. And I think both are necessary in a way. And um, I uh, agree with, uh, with Barrow that it's in, in a way, it's it's um, it's a hustle and complex to to check boxes in, in a way. Um, but uh, what I would wish for is that we have uh, certain projects and you have the visibility of, of of a change. But then in the end, you also need an evaluation for for the process to to see who was really participating behind and in front of the camera. And um, I'm very happy to have all those initiatives right now in, in Germany. Artef is one of them. And we were happy that we were invited to participate in, in Artef. And um, Artef for, for myself was um, yeah, very instructive and inspiring. Um, as I knew already uh, in advance that I had more questions than answers, but uh, after Artef, I knew that I even had more questions than I thought I had. And um, I think that's part of the process. So we try to uh, include the, the industry. We try to get um, as many views as possible. Possible. We, we created a, um, a group, a diversity uh, workforce. And um, it's like, I think it's like 60% industry and 40% film fund. And yeah, we try to include as many perspectives as possible. And um, we're talking about workshops or seminars uh, we want to uh, host and we already had like 10 I just checked before before I came here and um, then on the other hand we also want to touch the regulations so uh, in October we will start with like a consult consulting company that specializes on diversity and process change management and so we want to look at our processes we want to look at ourselves as an institution we want to look at our regulations we want to see how we constitute our juries, who's part of a jury. I think that's also uh, very important, which perspectives are uh, deciding which pro uh, projects to fund. And yeah, I think it's an ongoing process. And I'm very happy to uh, be invited here or to be invited by Marion or uh, Temba um, Bebe or invite me to some initiatives and just to, to uh, yeah, gain more knowledge and have an exchange on the experiences we have. And BFI, for example, is, has been um, very helpful. We already had a workshop on BFI standards, and I think they have been doing some really pioneering work, and um, yeah, which has also been evaluated. I, Melanie, you probably know Clive and Monka also from, from the London School of Economics with him. We, I have been in an exchange, and he has also invited me to, to a group, and so it's for now, I'm really happy that we have all this this energy and all the, those many people who want to have a change. And I think we really have to use that momentum. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I come to you, Elham. Uh, Patrick has mentioned that he has more questions than answers, but he also reflected on the positive energy that is happening today. And uh, I mean, you're a curator, you're, but also you're a producer, you're a story, storyteller in a way. And you also happen to consult on so many projects uh, uh, worldwide, but also in Europe. 
How do you react to everything that has been uh, said so far in the discussion? Do you feel as a person of color living in London that your stories will have more chances to be heard when you hear of such initiatives? Uh, do you feel more included in the conversation when there are more initiatives? How do you, how do you see that? Um, well, first of all, really lovely to be here with everyone. And thank you, Rabia, for the invitation. Um, I've, I've made so many notes, I actually can't uh, work out where to start uh, with my really messy notepad. I mean, I really appreciate the, the words and the care in the words being used today and the perspectives and the kind of consciousness of positionality and questions around um, intersectionality as well as diversity. I think I feel in a sense that I should play also a role of like devil's advocate because I'm very much the only uh, like individual essentially in this space. And I think in, uh, initiatives are really important and I think they are doing something important. Um, but I do have questions around this. Um, well, I have several questions, I guess. You know, on one hand, there's a question of initiatives within big institutions that have existed in a certain way for a very long time. Bira used the word cemented, and I think that's really interesting around the idea of building and spaces that have been built in a certain way. Um, they've been built in that way for a reason. You know, it's kind of very colonial practice of divide and conquer or kind of existing in a certain way, exclusionary. So, so my question in a sense is, can institutions really diversify when at the core they've been made in a certain way? Um, are schemes enough or are they kind of like taking the attention away from the core of what needs to really happen? Um, that's one question, I guess. There's, I think in the way that everyone's speaking is really, you know, as, as I said, you know, the words are really kind of carefully thought through and there's a lot of uh, thinking and work and acknowledgement of how ongoing that work is, uh, which is necessary because I think the experiences of exclusion are ongoing and they're multifaceted and they're kind of very subtle at times. And dismantling those is going to, is you know, it's work. And I think existing within spaces where you kind of, you, you're on the receiving end of certain things is work in itself. Um, but so this talk of kind of the center and the margin is also um, reflecting on the margin as something that needs to come into the center when sometimes it's the center that needs to go into the margin, very bell hooks framing. And I think about that a lot as someone who's produced work that, that is traditionally kind of quieter voices. You know, I, I don't necessarily think often of, of people as themselves marginalized because it might be that they are within the majority of their own reality. And I, so I think these framings are something that can also at times be problematic. Um, one thing that I think really I struggle with within the film industry is how little actual filmmaking seems to be, be valued or filmmakers. I feel like we're so often at the end of the supply chain somehow, and yet we are actually supplying the work. So everything exists around films. And yet, you know, we're kind of, I think more and more, you know, independent filmmakers really struggling to make work on our own terms, to live uh, comfortably. And I think that's the way in which um, the film industry is a very closed shop. You know, you need a certain level of comfort to be able to engage, but it also means you need a certain level of comfort to be able to engage on your own terms and have agency and keep doing the work that you want to do. And, and the industry is very much created in a very hierarchical way. So, you know, participating in a film festival is often at a filmmaker's cost, but if you're anyone else within the industry, that's not something that you need to think about. If you're within an institution, it's covered by an institution. If you're a film critic, you're invited. And, you know, th there are so many ways in which everyone who's kind of working or whose work draws on um, the films that are being made are supported to be a part of the industry, whereas filmmakers aren't. And that's something that I just, I think is really important within this conversation around diversity, because that will obviously affect people who are, um, who are kind of, ha have perhaps less means or less kind of, less means to, to participate on the same terms as others, perhaps. 
Um, so I, 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 yeah, the, the question of like economic redistribution, I think, you know, I think about this a lot. I'm invited to take part in lots of, um, you know, talks and lots of surveys and to kind of have lots of coffees with people. And, you know, so often I have lots of coffees with people whose job it is to think about certain things. And it's not my job to think about those things, but I have certain perspectives and I gain perhaps nothing really from that coffee. And uh, apart from, and in economic terms, I perhaps gain a coffee and I could make that coffee much cheaper at home. Do you know what I mean? That That's the kind of, um, nobody's paying for my time when I complete a questionnaire. And yet actually it's really important that my time is paid for when I complete a questionnaire because so many people completing that questionnaire are part of institutions and their time is paid for and they don't necessarily see that and I think that's one of the things that will actually, the kind of consciousness of that and, and thinking about how to address that and to level the playing field of people's voices being included um, will be important. Um, I think along the same lines, but slightly tangential thought also, I think so often about grievance procedures within institutions, it goes back to my first point about how can you complain how can you give feedback when you feel that something hasn't worked? And how can that complaint be managed to send to you as an individual rather than to protect the institution? Because that's so often how institutions are also built. Um, and it goes back to this idea of policy that Melanie touched on, this idea that policy is where you start. And it's, yes, it's where you start, but it's behavior that needs to change. And it's really... I mean, I'm always really baffled by the notion that we actually need like anti-harassment policy. What kind of societies do we live in? What kind of industry do we have if we need to rely on a policy to kind of underline the fact that it shouldn't be allowed, enabled, or even possible to kind of think that that's acceptable behavior. So I think um, I have lots of questions and I think they're all very interlinked. Um, I really appreciate all of the different spaces and the thinking that's happening around things. Um, and I suppose my final point is that I think all of these conversations are really important. And I'm also really, I mean, I'm really hopeful on one level, but I'm, I'm also quite worried about the way that the world is going. And so many film funds are like arm's length government organizations, which means that in a sense, they are following a government line. Um, I'm speaking from the UK, we've just voted for Brexit, we don't need to talk about it, but that should tell you something about where our government stands in relation to diversity, um, international um, collaboration, uh, being part of groups, speaking to the rest of the world, and that will filter down into our public organisations, it will filter down into the films that we make and what we say, and it will filter down into perhaps we will have to be more resourceful about how we do things and how we make things. Um, but I think that's one of the additional reasons why the, the independent people, the small people, the people who aren't part of institutions need to be supported when they can be supported to really level the playing field. Because at the end of the day, um, institutions do follow the line and the line at the moment is moving towards the, the right all over the world. Um, I think maybe I'll, I'll stop there with my like my my challenges. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very interesting when what you what you mentioned, uh, Elham, of course. And I want to uh, go from your questions to Bevo actually, which where the question that I have, um, Elham has been mentioning really those people who do not fit or are not part of uh, institutions or do not necessarily fit in the mold, and these people do not necessarily get the support. And I come to you with the creation of the new Dawn Film Fund. Um, I mean, if we look on paper, basically, um, the leadership in Europe is predominantly, predominantly white. And of course, the state of things with the new fund is that it is put together by two white persons, actually. Um, so what, what I wanted to understand or ask you is, how much do you believe that people of color or people from marginalized groups or people from communities that are not necessarily addressed need to be put much more forward to initiate change, to bring more sustainable change and to bring them more directly into the conversation. I mean, Patrick has also mentioned 
who are the funders who are funding these films when when we're still in the in the white model and uh, how much do you believe that people of color should be put forward to be part of a conversation well i'm actually still pondering some of ellen's remarks just now because i think she hit the mark very rightly in outlining uh, the underlying inequality that is there, because um, I keep thinking about when I, during an opening speech in the height of Me Too for IFFR, um, I mentioned that um, uh, all these all these uh, power abuses were coming to coming to the public, and uh, they were mostly done by white heterosexual males of a certain status or power in the film industry. So I said, well, this naturally concerns me at that point. And I think it's, uh, there, there's an there's a underlying unfairness to the whole situation in saying, well, if filmmakers of color um, uh, find it too hard to gain access to film funds, for instance, that they need to fix the problem. It's their thing to, to bear. And what Elam just mentioned, there's plenty of, and I've had this conversation with many of the initiatives that we, you know, support as much as we can, by the way, within the Netherlands that say, well, we need to have, there's an initiative that's literally called Color Initiative, which is a grassroots element and hugely exploded in terms of people that say, we're gonna rally against that cause. And we're talking about casting, we're talking about lighting, we're talking about entrance, we're talking about um, who gets to decide what at the public broadcasters, for instance. And they were all doing it for nothing. They were all doing it without a fee, without a salary, without any sort of economic fallback situation. And if you take into considering some of the additional elements there after uh, after decades of uh, demographic uh, crystallization, if you will, then uh, that in itself is already a problem. Because for, for the ones that um, in our case, study in Amsterdam at the Film Academy, get their first network, uh, have parents that they can fall back on and then engage into this hugely riskful undertaking of wanting to be a filmmaker with no certainty, no income, uh, depending on funders, broadcasters, distributors, sales agents who all look differently. That is a huge challenge. And I, I think it's get, it, it doesn't get enough uh, addressing. And uh, I thought it was a very, uh, for me, also a very valuable experience to be within a uh, fantastic group of people within ARTEF that also sometimes very personally still share their stories and where they're coming from that opens up next to, you know, almost on an academic level, thanks to Amelia, uh, an understanding of, of just, you know, how intersectionality actually works and where it's come, coming from and how that is based upon structures that have been cemented or formed over decades, not over centuries, actually. Uh, but that personal touch is very relevant. So to answer your question directly, of course, that's the whole thing. I mean, uh, and this is, I think it's an, an even bigger situation to all gatekeepers to realize and policymakers, uh, who are you doing it for? We had an internal um, with all of with our, with the entire team and, and um, a feedback session the other day and said, well, actually, what we need to be striving for is that filmmakers become less dependent on us. Somehow regain that agency in a way that is useful, but the, the depth of how far you need to go in those elements, taking all the elements of the structure and the racism into consideration is huge. It's huge, and uh, there's there's one element there which I always find um, very frustrating, is that we um, uh, we start complaining or discussing semantic issues, and they are very real and important. But at the end of the day, you just want to make sure that those films are made, get supported, get seen, get realized, and that sometimes seems to be the struggle between the academic discussion on one side and let's just make a movie at the other uh, spectrum. And um, uh, uh, I guess that was also maybe maybe my little if unwanted contribution to the Artif group was always to say, well, uh, I want an inclusive film industry just as much as you do. I don't want to see 
only what looks like me, I, I, I don't like it. And you deal in terms of, well, just how wide fragile are you actually, Piero? Fine, that's all good, bring it on, let's discuss that. But let's keep the filmmaking at heart and to to consider that the um, that the even let's say put it this way even if we are fully open and uh, equal in the approach to the filmmakers that could or could not access public funding that still does not do justice in any way shape or form to the actual situation which has many many more factors of a general systematic uh, uh, set of exclusionary measures through microaggression through micro discrimination or outright stuff of people just simply have no clue of what they're saying this coming from a country who used to have black peat as a national holiday can you imagine this this is only 10 years ago so um, uh, i have no illusion of being able to have any short small fix of doing things but i think every step that you can take you should definitely grab it with two hands which means including the people in the conversation or giving them the keys to the car go on drive and um it's 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 really a process that will take many many years and there's one other thing that i found very um uh, telling maybe slightly frustrating also but telling that once you have a discussion also with other funders or broadcasters or others or festivals or programmers what they tend to do is say yeah but we're already doing this this and this and this and this like we're already we're already here you know don't worry we got this one covered can we move on to the next thing please which is obviously not how things work obviously not in any way shape or form so all those little steps of of uh uh, taking the issue not just seriously, but also being willing as uh, part of the system, as I guess I have to describe myself, to say, well, uh, think about it in a totally different way, I think is very, very relevant, and that will take, uh, and that will never end that process. And I, I guess that's what why we're making cinema and love it to begin with. I mean, this is you know by 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 far the best medium and best form to have a visual conversation of what it actually means to be a human being. That is actually, I mean, the the I take your sentence. Let's make a movie, and I want to throw that at Marion because Marion as. As you said in the beginning, also, uh, you're part of so many initiatives, uh, which might be a lot of work for, on one hand, but also on the other hand, maybe it gives you always different perspectives on things. You manage, of course, the, um, the you're the co-director of the Documentary Association of Europe, but you also uh, are co-founder of Docsbox, which really supports um, um, Arab filmmakers with potential trainings and residencies in, in Germany. And many of these people work here in Germany now. They have uh, uh, you know, they're part of the German film industry. And I wanted really to ask you, um, do you really believe at the moment that enough has been, is been, being made in, in Europe? Um, do you see all the initiatives that you are taking part of enough? Uh, what do you believe should be, should be made at this stage? Well, that's a really big question. I would like to first circle back for a second to Elham and then also comment on some of the things that Beryl said, and I think it kind of ties into your question. First, Elham, thank you very, very much for sharing so generously and elaborately um, a lot of the challenges, and I couldn't agree more with many things that you said. And I think one of the things that you just mentioned, and this ties into what Beryl said just now also about the institutions, is the question of the consultants that you have a coffee with that basically tell you what are you supposed to do in your full-time job and then you go back and implement it. Now I'm over exaggerating, but it is, it is going into the direction. And I think many of us have, um, um, I mean, many of us, I have experienced it in different contexts and, and, and I hear Elham and, and, and I think it, it's also based on which, because I sometimes do work also more in the project and international development field, it's kind of a way of working that is very present in that field. And this brings me back to this question of, um, yes, obviously I completely and 100% agree with Barry when he's saying, um, when you're saying, focus on the filmmakers, these are films that need to be done and we need to create an ecosystem that enables um, films to be made. At the same time, um, to, 
change a situation where there are unpaid consultants and struggling filmmakers, I really do believe we have to change. And I know it's challenging and I know it's long term, but eventually what needs to happen is a change needs to happen within these organization, organizations. Who sits at the table? Who has the decision making power? That's also why uh, I, mean, I know because I had a conversation about it with Patrick, like the, what, what they are doing, or of course, what you have the BFI have been doing, Barry, you mentioned it too, is like looking inward, looking in how do we make decisions? Who makes the decisions? What do we look like? Do we all look the same? Are we actually, and I go back to what Melanie said, we are talking in, in many ways on, on different levels, not only for funds, but also for other film institutions that are not necessarily funders, but uh, funds, but create trainings or or, or offer, offer other kind of support. They are funded by public money. So they have to hold themselves account accountable. And we have to, I mean, again, I'm including myself and I say, what about they? Because it's a, it's a big challenge. It's like, be accountable um, to the fact that you are dealing with public money and that you're representing um, a, a community and a society that doesn't look, that don't look like you are looking. And I think that's that's where a lot of the work needs to be done because, and that's the danger. And, and this is what both you, Vero and Elha mentioned as well. It's like, because of the initial, like this creation of initiatives and many of them are amazing and I'm so happy to be part of them and that they are around, et cetera. But there is actually, I do see the danger very much. And I agree here with Vero of organizations saying, but we are already part in this initiative. So the work is done. So we are just kind of paying lip service and this is where we have ticked the box. So we can actually sit comfortably in our space where we are and remain as we are because we claim that we are already doing the work here and actually we are the good guys and we are and, and racists are other people. So we don't need to, we don't, we can stop caring here. And I really think that this is where we need to hold ourselves, our colleagues, our institutions accountably accountable and eventually also those who fund us. And now talking about the challenges, like for instance, in creating the Documentary Association of Europe, we are, everything that has been done, we have in the meantime, 400 members from across um, the, from across Europe and beyond. Um, and we are still working, both of it, Bridget O'Shea and I, we are doing this job completely voluntarily because we haven't been able, due to the pandemic, to raise funds and obviously this, this has to change. However, in the actual situation of creating a new initiative, it's so easy, and I know it from my own day-to-day -day work, it's so easy to fall into the trap of repeating the same things. Um, for example, because we currently don't have a lot of money um, to pay people, we heavily re rely on generosity of others on them being generous to us and today and to the community and wanting to pay back. So that's just one of many examples. Or also, how do we, we, we walk around and say, and now I'm very critical to myself, the Documentary Association of Europe, even though it has Europe in its name, that's why we also try and establish the name day even more. We say, we don't, we, we don't mind what passport you hold, where you come from, where you're based. If you're a diaspora, you're welcome. Everyone is welcome. This is like a transparent, community and we try and create um, um, discounts and create packages for people who might not be able to pay the fee. However, are we doing the work till the end? Are we really kind of um, implementing what we are preaching? So I really think that this is like this holding oneself in within an institution and a space responsible is, um, is, um, is our daily responsibility. Then in terms of the the, the the filmmakers that uh, I think being a filmmaker in diaspora, um, depending on where you're from, and not depending on where you're from, all the time, is a very can be a very difficult position to be in, because often you're seen as neither nor, and the funder and funds would still require you to be a labeled filmmaker of the country that they think you represent. And I think, I mean, I don't want to, because I'm not in the situation, I would feel it would feel wrong to me to go into more details of that. I think just one thing I wanted to say is um, that, of course, in this, um, with Docsbox, well, not um, Docsbox, but the community of filmmakers um, from the so-called Arab region that Docsbox is supporting and also representing, um, I guess what, 
what was what is very obvious that there's this there are these funding waves and that there are moments in which um, a certain group of filmmakers, for instance, um, at the time from Egypt, from Tunisia, when the when the revolutions took place in these countries or from Syria, were very interesting to to a market um, reality and also to fund us more from the NGO spectrum. And then suddenly there was a lot of money, but a lot of the initiatives uh, died because of the funding dying and the interest vanishing. And I guess that's a constant struggle in that. Because we have little time, I want to use the last 15 minutes with my last three questions, actually. Um, I will go straight to Melanie. Uh, uh, Marion has been really s speaking about what people need to do and how do we change our mentalities and things. Uh, you, Melanie, are really working a lot with numbers and data analysis. And I wanted to ask you how important it is to collect these data and process them and reflect on diversity and inclusion. Uh, recently, there was a panel at the Venice Film Festival, which uh, I attended. It was a, a seminar on gender equality and inclusion inclusivity in the film industry and it focused on Italy and gender was always addressed as male and female and one of the speakers actually said that we don't have any numbers on non-binary professionals yet and for me this was very interesting because this is a panel on gender and how come we just still consider today in Europe men and women as the only two genders. So I wanted basically to reflect very briefly with you how important is it to really look at these things from a statistical point of view and using it actually in uh, addressing diversity and inclusion? I think it's, um, it's important to set a baseline. So it's really difficult to understand where you're, where you're at or where you want to get to without the data. So I think we all know, like you, when I did the Black Star research, uh, there were no surprises in what it showed in terms of representation on screen for Black actors. I think we all knew that the numbers would be very low. We knew that the um, representations would be really stereotypical but in saying that um, that data allowed conversations to happen in a way that cut through any question of whether that was the truth or not and so I think data allows you to start at a base level um, of conversation to sort of move things forward. I think what has happened however in the last few years is that people think if you're trying to do data then you're sort of done like that that's the work if you're collecting data or you've done a report then that's great and this is these are the numbers and we know it's terrible and we're just going to carry on doing what we were doing before so I think what's important about the data is it sets a baseline that it's the very it's the bare minimum of of stuff that you you can be doing to understand the landscape and specific areas of, of lack or you know where the kind of spots are where you could be giving more support in that area um, but unless you're doing anything to address that or to meet your targets or you know whatever it is then it's sort of useless really but I think like for us it's given us uh, for example with our diversity standards we released the first data report um, last year so they really weren't set up with data in mind so it took a while to sort of analyze that data and, and bring that forward and and it showed us that it's doing really well in terms of supporting women behind and in front of the camera but a lot of other areas it just wasn't and there were really sort of uh, low numbers for areas such as um, uh, transgender uh, but also and disability but also understanding that there is a real lack of trust in terms of people providing us with that data so that the data doesn't always reflect what's happening because that idea of sort of giving up your protected characteristics when that's been used to discriminate against you uh, in the past, all of this stuff needs to be understood and, and worked out, um, you know, sort of within those legal limits and, and kind of that trust needs to be built. So there's a lot of work to be done, um, especially in our industry in terms of setting that kind of, you know, that agenda and um, making data right and sort of uh, collected in an inclusive way and asked about in an inclusive way but I think it's sort of uh, necessary and the, the very basic thing you could do to be able to hold yourself accountable um, to the work that you're doing as in, in diversity and inclusion otherwise without that you're sort of making assumptions about what you're doing and whether that's successful or not and that's that's not really very helpful. 
And uh, I go to you, Patrick, coming from uh, what we as individuals need to do and how do we reflect on things and also maybe using data to support us with the work that, uh, that is done. We go to the films that are actually produced today, actually, and there are European films today with diverse stories that are emerging every now and then, which are hailed as being films that showcase diversity in front and behind the camera. Here I can I can name uh, Born in Evin by Mariam Zari, which actually won the Perspectiva Deutsches Kino at the 2019 Berlinale, and it is it was supported actually by Hessen Film and Medien. There are films in Europe that highlight migrant stories and that are also intersectional. Uh, Photo Dry by um, Faraz Shariat and No Hard Feelings, which won the Teddy Award at Berlinale 2020. And there are also films that address inclusion, um, uh, namely now recently at Venice there was this film, this film from Finland uh, called The Blind Man Who Did Not Want to See the Titanic by T. Uh, Timo Niki. It's not a documentary film. It's a, it's a fiction film about a disabled man. And it happens to be that the actor actually uh, uh, is blind and in a wheelchair, but the script of this film has been written as a fiction. So I wanted to ask you, um, coming from talking about perspective and numbers and organizations, um, how do you as a funding body look at the films that are produced today, at the films that you support today that how do you feel your role is important in highlighting these stories? And do you get enough of these stories actually to support? I think it was Beryl who said it uh, before that, uh, of course, those uh, stories are very, very important. And on the other hand, it's also very important that people from marginalized groups are making films or are uh, behind um, on front of the camera, um, no matter what the story, final story is. I mean, if it would be an historic biopic um, about, a, I don't know, um, about a white person, um, but it would be made by a crew that mostly consists of marginalized uh, people, I think that would also be good. Um, Regarding the projects that are um, applied, that, that are applying for for funding in our institution, um, yes, we were looking and um, at the people who are applying uh, with a project, and I think that's like a very recent discussion that we are having here. Who should tell which story is uh, an important aspect, and um, yeah, then we're also looking at the stories themselves, um, what they are telling, and then. Uh, as I said earlier, we have we have a, like a jury, and um, our CEO is head of the jury. She has one um, of the voices in, in, in the jury, and um, I think it's important that you have a diverse jury itself. That you have like uh, all kind of perspectives who have the competence and sensitivity to to judge those uh, projects and that applied to to see if, if they are um, offering a new perspective, a new story, and who's telling those stories. And um, I think end of the day, and that's something I want to get in, in touch with, with Melanie at another point is um, how do you uh, quantify um, data? How can you make sure that you're on the right track? I mean, if you, there are those lighthouse uh, projects or the, the super successful projects that everybody sees, but what's beyond those projects? And um, how does participation really look? And uh, it's really, are we really inclusive? Are we um, including the people um, as they are living in our society today? And uh, that is something that we want to make sure. Um, I want to finish things with, uh, with Elham. I want to put things in perspective today. Um, home office basically has really changed the way we work. Uh, it has enabled that the staff of every institution to be able to work at home. This has been easily made, I mean, easily made. Um, at the same time, we hear that in order to implement change in our uh, industry, make the film industry more um, uh, how do you say, inclusive, more diverse, we need time, we need more strategical thinking, we need to do more this and to do more that. However, putting the whole planet on home office is was very easy. Um, I wanted to know from you as really closing words, what do you feel is for you vital today to really, really change the industry? Um, what, how, what would you feel is tangible and could work to make things move in the right direction without always having to question the same systems and the same institutions and the same application forms. What do you feel for you is today crucial to move forward? 
A very big question. <laughs> I think I'll go, I, I'm money, basically. I, I think this is a space of economic inequality. I think money is an enabler and it's, it is what gives you agency to, to do things on your own terms. Um, it's not the only thing, um, but it is a really significant thing. And I think that it, it is the thing that does challenge it presents a challenge at all levels of intersections. We haven't talked at all about, you know, people who are carers, whether it's of children or of other people, but, you know, economics in that sense is extremely important. And that's something that's wholly invisible and never necessarily taken um, consideration of within budgets, for example, it's, it's quite rare to see that. I think thinking about COVID, you know, so many productions were able to keep going. Um, so many film funds agreed to, you know, additional funding for specific measures that had to be put in place. There was this kind of blanket 15% over the budget that was suddenly raised. And, you know, if that was possible, then perhaps there are levels of care that could be possible and implemented across the board. There's 15% for COVID, you know, you know, measures. Perhaps there could be, I don't know, there are films that would require like psychological support. There are films that would require care support um, for whether it's individuals on set or in the crew or whether it's people who need support with their childcare. Um, there are all sorts of things that fall under the space of care and that aren't really part of how we think of our industry and, and how we do things. That's not surprising because it's also not part of how we think of any industry because care isn't really conceptualized within the kind of capitalist model. Um, it wasn't conceptualized at the basis of the kind of modern economy and so you know the, the most caring professions are the least well paid that's not how our societies work um, but I think that's something that we can do and I think that's something that would be really valuable to do um, there's an organization in the UK called Raising Films that does really amazing work in that space thinking about carers and I think that that um, consideration, that care is really what we need to kind of drive things forwards alongside a kind of economic redistribution. Um, and I know I've, I've already talked about it a little bit, but I, I suppose I'll just say that I think we've been talking a lot about making space and broadening space, like diversifying space. And sometimes that also needs to mean giving up space. You know, there are some people that need to also step out or step down or move aside so that somebody else can enter that space. And I think there have been lots of really interesting moves where we've seen kind of things being formed or people kind of taking on, um, you know, taking on certain positions. What needs to happen next also is, is for certain things to be given up so that others can enter that space. And I think maybe that's the next, the next step. Thank you so much, uh, Elhum, and thanks so much for everyone who just took part in this, also for your time. I think we managed in an hour and 15 minutes to just have a nice discussion, conversation on what is currently taking place in Europe and how possibly we can move things forward. Um, I think what's very important is that there is a conversation that is happening and this conversation needs to continue. And if we're happy to have an initiative or a fund that is established, as Bero said in the beginning, it's a constant also questioning of that fund. So that I'm really happy to, to hear that the fund is always in a questionable phase and that you bring in a different set of ideas to that fund. As also Melanie said, it's you bringing a set of numbers, you change things, you look at things with different perspectives. So I really thank you for your time. I really thank you for broadening our perspectives as well. And um, I hope to see you physically sometime soon, somewhere with watching more diverse films and hearing more diverse stories and attending more diverse panels with our industry. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can. Uh, bye bye. Thank you.